Um, so uh, without further ado, um, here, here is Kay Ring. Hi guys, so nice to see you all. Um, I'm going to start by putting my email into the chat just so you guys have it because I would love to continue this conversation with you guys afterwards if there's something that you have questions about, if there's something that, oh, I put that in the wrong place, hang on. Can you all see that? My email says privately. All right, hang on, everyone in meeting. Oh. There we go, I got it. Okay. Today we're going to be talking about how to re reduce household waste, but there are a lot of tangential conversations that could happen in this. So if there's anything that you guys want to talk to me about regarding waste, please email me. I'm always around. I want to start with a very quick check-in, but there are a lot of us here. So what I'm going to do is instead of going around the room and asking each person, because I know that sometimes we don't always want to talk in these things. If you want to just raise your hand or if you want to unmute yourselves um, and just chime in, what I wanna know is where are you in your zero waste journey and what is your next step? So what are the things that you wanna improve on? What are the things that you're working on? What are the things that you have questions about? And if you are already completely zero waste, great, that's awesome. But what I'm really excited to hear are the people who are at the very beginning or who have been doing this for a while but want to have a little refresher and to be reinvigorated. So um, I'll start. My name is Kay. I live in Mayapak or Mahopak. <laughs> and I have been doing this for a couple of years now, gradually working towards reducing my household waste completely. However, if you haven't noticed, we've had a little bit of a hiccup in the last year with this giant pandemic that we're still in the midst of. And I have taken some steps backwards and that's okay. And those are the things that I want to talk to you guys about today. So is there anybody who would like to, to join in? Go ahead. Hi, my name is Peggy and I compost and I recycle, but I really don't know anything about zero waste. So I'm eager to learn. I try to use conta reuse containers, um, but I don't know what I don't know. And I'm really eager to learn about this. So thank you for providing this programming. Thank you for being here. I love that. I don't know what I don't know. Same. Who's next? Janet. So I'm pretty passionate about, um, you know, diminishing our garbage. It's just my husband and I, we maybe produce one bag of garbage a month and we compost a lot. But the big thing is plastic to me. Um, you know, we, I'm trying to get away from packaging as much as possible. You know, I cook um, as close to the food item as possible, but there, I know there must be other things that I can do to d decrease the waste that's going into the plastic, you know, mass out there. Yeah. Yeah, I think like 20 to 30% of, of all of the stuff that ends up in a landfill is discarded packaging. So, yeah. Um, I have Julia who raised their hand. There you are. Yes, Julia. Hi, <clears throat> excuse me. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for providing this format. I'm um, excited to learn more and be a part of Sustainable Putnam. Um, I found you through Martha at Second Chance Foods um, because I'm just beginning my journey of giving back. And um, as, I'm sorry, I don't know her name, but the woman just mentioned plastic. Plastic is a big thing for me. Um, and going forward, and I'll email you this, uh, Ray, and we can talk more sideline on this, but <clears throat> excuse me, I um, would like to develop a green team in this area regarding plastic. Um, and this is through Interfaith Partners for Chesapeake Bay, which, uh, which takes care of waterways from Cooperstown, New York, all the way down to the Chesapeake Bay. Um, and plastic is becoming a huge issue, especially with single serve items. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm guilty of it too. I, I'm finding, I'm realizing there's so much plastic in my household. Um, and I would like to figure out a way to organize. Like I said, I'm gonna get myself trained in June 
to uh, create a green team and figure out a way to organize and do something about the plastic. Um, the, um, we're in a hiccup, as you say, regarding the pandemic, but also with recycling plastic, there is, it's very, it's become in the past few years, very complicated and difficult to recycle plastic. Um, and, um, and so I'm here to learn about other ways too that I can help sustain Putnam in an eco-friendly environment. Thank you very much. Thank you, I love that. Sign me up for the green team, we'll be in touch because that's- I Yeah, love. I'll email you, definitely. Yes, please. Okay. Wonderful, anybody else? I have my screen set up in a way that I have to scroll through to see everybody. Okay, so let's move on. Um, before we get started, I wanna just get on the same page about terms because we use words like garbage and trash and whatnot interchangeably. So when I say waste, what I'm talking about are all of the discarded materials in your home or that are getting out of your home. So it's anything that you don't need anymore. Think in terms of everything that comes in and out of your house through the door, as opposed to a, a pipe or a vent. Um, and I'm not really talking about the things that come into your home and then stay in the home for the rest of your life. I'm, I'm talking about the things that come into your home and have that quick turnaround time. A lot of those things are um, the single use plastics. I'm also talking about things like toys and clothes and paper, that sort of thing. So when we're talking specifically about zero waste, and this is where my certification comes in. Um, I am certified through the GBCI, that's the same accredit accrediting body that does the LEED certifications. They also offer a certification for businesses um, in zero waste. And the way that they define zero waste, well, the certification is true zero waste, true standing for total resource use and efficiency. They define zero waste as diverting 90% of your waste away from landfills and incinerators. It's important to remember that this is an industry term. What that means is um, facilities that make things, the gold standard is that they, they stop putting things into landfills and they move towards something called a circular economy, meaning the things that they produce eventually come back to them think a milkman they have jars they bring them to the dairy farm they get filled up they deliver them to people they pick them up again and they bring them back to the farm so it's a it's a circular economy right when it comes to running your household it's really difficult to first of all figure out how much waste you're producing the ways that businesses figure it out are very different than the way the ways that we could figure it out at home um, and it's also really difficult just to figure out like what, what is 90% for me? I don't know. Um, the zero waste movement has blossomed over the last decade or so. And this is kind of my interpretation of zero waste, taking this industry term and applying it to the home. So moving on. When I talk about recyclables, what I'm doing is talking about things that go into your recycling bin compostables are things that can be composted and then garbage is just my word for everything else it's important to remember that recyclables and compostables are not always recycled and composted and that's where we come in so how do we move towards zero waste like how do we reduce our household waste this is what we're here talking about right we actually know the answer to this this is something that we've been taught most of us since we were little kids and I bet if I say the first word, you're going to know the next two words that typically come after it. Reduce, say it in your heads, reuse and recycle. So we know these things. And these are things that we're supposed to do in a particular order. We're supposed to first reduce, then we're supposed to reuse, and then we're supposed to recycle. I'm gonna uh, spice it up a little bit and throw another one in there, re-earth. And what that means is composting. We'll get into that in a little bit. We're just gonna dive right in, okay? Um, I can give you my notes after if I'm going too quickly. You could also email me if you have more questions and we'll have a little bit of a chat at the very end of it. So very, very first, reducing. The number one way to reduce your household waste is to reduce the amount of things that you're bringing into your house. Uh, it's easier said than done, but that's okay. This isn't about being perfect. This is just about trying your best. When it comes to bringing things into the house, more often than not, these are things that we're buying. 
So before you buy anything, the number one way to reduce your waste is to think twice about buying that thing. Like, do I really need this? Is this something that, um, or something else that I could use instead of buying this new thing? Is it something that I can borrow from somebody? You could also delay your purchases. Decide that you wanna buy something and then don't buy it. Just give yourself a window of like two weeks. Now, obviously this doesn't work for everything. You can't walk into the grocery store and say, do I need this box of cookies? Am I gonna put this off for two weeks? You can't, don't do that. I'm talking about all the other things, okay? You'll know if you really need something if you've waited two weeks. Um, and there's, there's this thing that happens and it's a very intentional thing on part of people who sell things. And it's the, I need this now. I call it the, I need this now trap. Like you see it, maybe it's on sale. Maybe that sale is for a limited amount of time. There are businesses or websites that will say, you know, three other people have this in their cart and you're like, oh my God, they're going to run out. I need to get this now. This is just be aware that this is something that they're doing on purpose and don't fall for it. That thing will always be there. Don't worry. Um, you could also try and plan your purchases strategically. So I'm thinking about multi-purpose items instead of having a rice cooker and a yogurt maker, it have an instant pot that does all of those things at once or get, I don't know if you can see, but I have a blender that has a food processor attachment. So now I don't need a blender and a food processor, but to be honest, I don't know if I need a blender and a food processor. So these are the things that we should also be thinking about as well. Um, for things like food, you can meal plan, and I'll talk about that more in a little bit. You could also, um, in regards to your wardrobe, because textile waste is a huge problem, try a capsule wardrobe for a little bit, buy pieces that transition between seasons, or dig through the back of your closet and put things together in a way that makes you want to wear them again. Another way that you could reduce your waste is simply by going digital. I know a lot of people like to have hard copies of things, but if you're not one of those people, um, opt for email notifications instead of things that come by mail. You could use paperless billing and bill pay. Um, digital newspaper and magazine subscriptions are great. You could borrow eBooks from the library. I know Mayapac Library has a ton of eBooks. Um, and lastly, this is kind of one of those things that's, again, we're talking about doing the best we can, not about being perfect. When possible, invest in quality pieces that are going to last a long time, but also take care of the things that you already own. I'm going to zoom right through and go right into the next step. So we have reduce, next is to reuse. Um, we, reusing is simply just using items again or repurposing them into something else. So you can upcycle, which means, something like turning an old plastic cup into a like a seedling planter every time that you buy a jar um, peggy was saying that she likes to use things again as like storage containers so every time that you buy a jar you use the sauce you take that jar and you use it for something else um so one thing that i never really considered when it comes to reusing is buying things secondhand. And the first thing that pops into my mind is buying um, hand-me-downs and like secondhand clothing. So about 15% of the clothing that we buy is recycled. That's great, right? Except that 85% of the clothing that we buy ends up in a landfill. And that amounts, that ends up being millions and millions of tons um, in 2017, one of the figures that I found is 11.2 million tons of clothing ended up in landfills. So that's not even counting the stuff that ends up in an incinerator. And in our area, all of our garbage goes into an incinerator. Um, there are websites, there are stores, places like Goodwill, um, Poshmark, I'm seeing Patagonia in the chat section. They also um, repair a lot of stuff, which is another, I mean, when we talk about reduce, reuse, and recycle, there's lists of like 10 things that start with the letter R that we could be doing. I prefer to keep it to the four reuse, reuse, re reuse, reduce, reuse, re-earth, and recycle. 
Another one is repair. And I'll talk about that in a little bit too, but Patagonia is a great place. You could also, I was just talking to someone about this, talk to your friends and family and neighbors and just see what they have. There's always that like one time a year project that you do around the house that you think I need to buy something for this. Um, there are people here that I have swapped and shared like tools with. Like I don't need to have a ceramic drill bit, but Joe happens to have one that I borrowed. And there are times that he needs tools that I happen to have. And that's a great, that's a great thing to do. So my dad lives in a neighborhood, like a very close knit houses are close together neighborhood. And I was just telling Joe this before they as neighbors all pitched in and bought a snowblower together. This was like 10 years ago and the snowblower is still going strong. So there are now four houses that are sharing one snowblower and they worked it out in a way that um, my dad being the youngest one of the four homeowners that now own this snowblower, he paid a little bit less on the promise that he goes out and does the snow blowing every time that it snows. Um, so this is something great that you could do with friends and family. And a place like Sustainable Putnam is a fantastic place. I mean, our Facebook group, there's no reason why you can't go on there and say, hey, does somebody have this thing that I could borrow? There are also a bunch of other groups on Facebook that you could use. We have a buy nothing group in Carmel. I know that there's one in Brewster, there's one in Somers, and these are groups that you could join on Facebook. They are like town or neighborhood specific where you can share things and borrow things or give things away or get things. There's also um, Carmel Free Marketplace, which is a group that I started on Facebook. Join it, it's not just for Carmel, it's for like anybody who lives in the area. And this is a place where you can go and talk to your, you know, people who live nearby to see if they have something so you don't have to go out and buy it. Um, another thing about reusing is, um, guys, going antiquing is a way of reusing furniture. I was just listening to a, what was it? It was like an interior decor trends of 2021 kind of video. And they, one of the things that they said was, it's actually becoming quite popular to reuse furniture. It's like a, it's like a very chic sort of thing, I guess now to get furniture from other, from your friends or family or, you know, from an antique store. And uh, that's, I mean, that's reusing. When we think about items, there is its useful lifespan and then it's there's its actual lifespan so from the time that it's manufactured until whatever happens that that ends that item's lifespan whether it's going into a landfill or an incinerator if you're able to extend that lifespan for as long as possible i mean that's that's one step towards sustainable living that also reduces the amount of household waste that we have the less stuff that you buy, the more stuff that re you reuse, um, the less waste you are going to produce ultimately. Um, do we have, just let's just take a little break here for a second. Do you have any questions, comments? I'm just gonna zip through the chat for a second and see if there was anything that I missed. Okay, Hoopla. For those of you who don't know, thank you, Peggy, for that suggestion. It's an app that gives you, if you use your library card, it gives you access to digital books, audiobooks, I believe movies and television. Um, Libby is also another great app for that. Um, I found that Libby has more of the um, kind of like popular in in the now books and hoopla is really good for if you have kids that are in school they actually list by like required reading for this school required reading for that school fantastic resource um oh michael also mentioned the libby app rb digital is one that's new for me but i'm assuming that it's similar to libby i'm going to check that one out after this um patagonia resell so they they not only resell, they not only repair, but they also make clothing out of recycled materials, which is incredible. Julia was just talking about how recycling and specifically plastic is becoming more and more of a problem and that recycling is becoming more and more difficult. I'll get into that a little bit more in the recycling section, but anytime that you're able to um, buy anything recycled, that's one way that you can help to alleviate the recycling problem. 
um, Phillipstown, oh, Phillipstown Free, um, I don't know if it's called Phillipstown, oh, give me one second. Oh, so sorry about that. My coffee maker was making funny noises and it was burning. Okay, so Phillipstown Free, I'm, Peggy, if you don't mind speaking up about this, is this the Phillipstown Free Cycle Group? Um, when you live in Phillipstown, Cold Spring, Garrison, Nelsonville, you join the Facebook page for, uh, for Phillipstown Facebook and one of their offshoots is Phillipstown Free. And sometimes things are free or I bought a beautiful table and chairs and umbrella from my deck last summer that was used but in great shape people were oh, wow. it. it's really terrific and I had no idea that this existed that's wonderful so for those of you I'm in Carmel but for those of you on the other side of the county there's that option for you guys as well um, so buy nothing Carmel free marketplace and let's see Glass storage containers. Glass is one of those items that can be recycled basically in perpetuity. So it's a fantastic material. Um, oh, clothing swaps are another great thing. I'm seeing organic cow's milk in glass from Whole Foods. So the Whole Foods in Danbury does this as well. If you buy glass, or milk in glass bottles. You could bring those glass bottles back for a refund and they reuse them again. Okay, and Phillips found free stuff. Okay, we're all caught up. If you feel like, you know, there's something that you have that you want to stick in there as well, go ahead. I'll do another recap after I get through these next two sections. Okay, we did reduced, reuse. And now we're going to uh, take a little detour into re-earth, which is just a fancy and alliterative term for composting. So globally, we throw away about a third of all of the food that is produced. About 1.3 billion metric tons of food every year gets thrown out. So um, that's a lot of food waste. And I think that a lot of us are guilty of that as well. I know that I am. Um, I'm going to, for this section, I'm going to use basil as my example, just because this is something that I lived through last week. And uh, let's talk about it. The very first thing that you could do to reduce your food waste is meal planning. Sitting down, looking in your fridge. See, I'm looking over here. So my fridge is here. Looking at what you have in there, trying to use all of the food that you have, and then also planning um, what you're going to eat so that you could figure out what you're going to buy. Um, if you end up buying a lot of something, have a plan for that as well. So I got this big thing of basil, fresh basil, because I needed fresh basil for something. And I had a bunch left over. So one thing that you could do in meal planning is have a plan for all of the extras that you buy. Like, hey, I don't need this. Hello, friend, do you need basil? I have some at my house. I'll put it in a bag and throw it at your door next time I drive by. Um, you could also store your produce in a way that extends the life. Um, so for basil, you could stick that in a, a glass with, um, with water in it, kind of like a bouquet, and stick that in your fridge. You could also um, prep your food in a way that will make it last longer. So what I ended up doing was just chopping up the basil, putting it in an ice cube tray with some olive oil, sticking that in the freezer. So then I have these like olive oil cubes that I could use for next time. Um, and lastly, you could grow your own basil. And we actually have a workshop coming up in, let's see, March 7th from 2.30 to 3.30. It is growing stuff from the ground up. You'll either, if you don't already have this in your email, it will be in your email so you can sign up for that. Um, and another, another really big thing when it comes to throwing out food is um, around the world, about 800 million people suffer from chronic undernourishment. I think some of those people are even in our own communities and we would be able to actually feed every single one of them 
if we donated just a quarter of the food that is thrown out. We don't need to produce more food. We just need to take the food that is going to be thrown out and give it to the people who need it. And actually in our community, we have a fantastic organization that was already mentioned, um, Second Hand, oh, what is it called? Second Hand Food, no. Second Chance. Second Chance. I'm thinking Second Hand Clothes, no, Second Hand, Second Choice, Second Chance Foods. Martha Elder, who is the executive director, is also going to be doing a workshop in April, April 18th from 3 to 4.30. Um, and she is going to be talking specifically about reducing food waste. So if you have any questions about reducing food waste specifically, be sure to sign up for that because it's going to be fantastic and very informative. Um, and here's, here's the thing about Rear Thing. Um, those of you who know me know that I am actually the world's worst composter. I cannot figure it out. My compost, I mean, right now it's like a frozen sludge and the rest of the year, it's just kind of like a soupy brown mess and I don't know how to do it. So don't listen to anything that I say about composting. Go to um, Cornell Cooperative Extension. They have fantastic resources about composting. And that's really all I'm going to say about that because I don't want to, um, I don't want to talk about how terrible I am at composting anymore. Um, let's move on to recycling. This is something that I'm actually much more comfortable talking about. We talk about reduce, reuse, re-earth, and recycle. And this would be another, this would be like a, a cute little place for me to be like, last but not least. But no, no, no. Recycling is actually least. <laughs> It's the thing that we should be doing last. And the reason for that is it's been sold to us as this panacea, like it's going to serve all, it's gonna solve all of our problems with our, our plastic use. And we're gonna be able to continue using single use plastic as before because we could just recycle it. And no, that's not the case. Because what ends up happening is, um, like I said earlier, things that can be recycled aren't necessarily always recycled. When you put something in your recycling bin, it gets picked up, it gets sorted, it gets turned into raw materials for something else, but then it just sits there until a manufacturer comes, or comes along and purchases those raw materials to then be made into something new. If nobody comes along, then that stuff actually just ends up going into the landfill. Um, a lot of times, well, not a lot of times. There are a couple of TED Talks with, um, you know, the prominent zero wasters and a lot of times here, or this is all of the garbage that my family of four has produced in the last year. And it's like, that's great. But that probably means that you're recycling things. And some of that stuff might not be recycled. There's really no way of knowing if the things that we put into the recycling bin get recycled. So when it comes to this idea of zero waste, diverting 90% of our waste away from landfills, it's really hard to know, is this stuff actually being recycled? So the best way to go about it is to not buy things that need to be recycled. Um, and that's really hard. That's really, really hard. If we wanna talk more about recycling, we can. Um, but the one thing that will leave you with, with recycling, is please, when you can, when you think of it, buy things that are made from recycled materials. They are often more expensive than things that are made out of virgin material, but you're taking all of those things away from landfill. And that's what's most important. Um, are there any questions, comments, anything so far? Let me change my screen so that I could see everybody. Okay, let me do a quick recap of what's going on in the Cat. Um, Julia is creating a hub for food waste. Oh, fantastic. Um, from Sustainable Putnam. Joe, I'm assuming that's you. You get milk delivered from the Hudson Milk Company. Yeah. Yeah, I saw uh, the truck going up and down my street, uh, and my neighbor had a milk box, you know, like an old fashioned milk box on his uh, door stoop. So I I kind of like watched for the truck and noted the name. And when the pandemic started, I, you know, I, I went for it. It's 
pretty nice. That's hey, great. Kate, you had mentioned something once um, another time about, I think it was you who, who mentioned it and it was a, a term, I think you, I think it was aspirational recycling. Does that sound familiar? That sounds like something I would say. Yeah. And I think you were talking about the fact that a lot of us, you know, throw things into the recycling bin, just kind of not knowing whether it's recyclable or not. And, and in a way it becomes almost like, a, you know, uh, like a, an absolution of our, of our, you know, our bad habits of buying stuff that we hope could be recycled, but we don't really know. And while it's it's hard to kind of figure that out, I think that, you know, when you really get down to it, like I, 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 I really took that to heart and I, you know, now realize, you know, like the little bits of plastic I used to throw in the recycling bin, they're not really recyclable because they gum up the works in the sorting plant, you know, so that goes in the waste can and it makes me even more conscientious about, you know, every little thing I get. Yeah. I think that a lot of times when we put things into the recycling bin, it's, it makes us feel good, but that's about all it does because it does eventually end up in, in our area in an incinerator. Um, and that stinks. That's the, I mean, that's, that's the worst. It's terrible. Um, yeah, I call it aspirational recycling. Um, and this is not anybody's fault. This is actually something that has been, um, it's, it's an idea that's been manufactured and, and fed to us. Uh, I can't remember where it was. It must have, it was probably a podcast. And I was listening to the, it's, it's kind of like the history of recycling and it's dark. It's not, it is not a fun story. If you think back to the time before plastic, the, in the, the day of the milkman, everything came in a glass bottle and those glass bottles were reused. And when those glass bottles couldn't be used as glass bottles anymore, they were broken down and made into something else, made out of glass. There were um, laws put in place that basically um, protected the plastic manufacturers. There's a lot of lobbying that goes on on behalf of, of plastics. And one of the things that was born out of all of that is this recycling movement. And we've all been taught from the time, I mean, all of us, from the time that we were much younger than we are now, that recycling is just what we're supposed to do. You get something, you're done with it, you put it in the recycling bin. And we've been conditioned to not think about this stuff. Oh, someone said the story of stuff. That's it, right? That's it. That's what I'm thinking of. Thank you. Um, it's not our fault. I mean, it's a terrible thing to think about. We're kind of victims in this. But ultimately, the real victim is our planet. Because we've gotten to the point where we're not thinking about this stuff anymore. The whole purpose of this conversation is to get us thinking again. All of this stuff that I just threw at you, um, all of these questions that we should be asking ourselves, do I really need this thing? Can I borrow it from somebody else? Do I have a friend that has it that we could you know, go have on? These are the ways that we stop and slow down the process so that we're not on autopilot anymore because ultimately autopilot benefits who? Not you and I. It lines the pockets of the plastics manufacturers. Um, it lines Jeff Bezos's pockets and everybody else who is invested in this stuff, not us. I think it's time that we slow down and it's time that we think about what do I need? What do I want? Me personally, I want to just spend time with my family and my friends. I don't want to be shopping all the time. I want my house to be um, a place where I can keep all of the things that I love that inspire me. And ultimately having less things makes room for me to love the things that I have even more. I want to um, be an intentional 
shopper and consumer. So ultimately I do love stuff. I love, I love clothes. I love home decor. I love, um, you know, like cute glasses and things that, that just make me happy. But I also want to do it in a way that, um, that really reinforces my place as an environmental steward, as somebody who is taking care of, of the earth. Um, but I want to do it in a way that doesn't stress me out. I want to do it in a way that um, doesn't cause me any anxiety. Um, I don't know about you guys, but part of the reason why I started this whole zero waste journey is it was a way for me to quell that eco anxiety that is kind of always gnawing at the back of my head. Um, Joe, when you throw things out, those little plastic bits that you feel guilty about, those are the things, you know, when we, when we become zero waste, it's, we don't want to feel that guilt anymore. Um, the, one of the things that I teach my kids, I have two little kids, they're two and four. Um, my kind of parenting ethos is that you should be kind to each other, you should be kind to animals, you should be kind to the planet, and you should be kind to yourself. But if all of the stuff that we're doing being in being kind to the planet makes you be unkind to yourself, then what's the point of all of this? It's really about just doing the best that you can. That's why this conversation today is not a how to, it's not, this is what you should do. This is what you should buy. This is what you should not do. No, it's just a philosophy. And this philosophy has been taught to us from the time that we were little reduce, reuse, and now we're adding re-earth and then recycle. What I would like to do, um, maybe a little bit earlier than I intended on, but let's, let's do it. I want for everyone here to break out into the breakout rooms. So we have, I don't know how many people, there are going to be four groups. And each of these four groups, I'm going to put them into the chat. Group number one, what you're going to be focusing on is reducing. Group number two, you will be talking about um, reusing. Group number three will be re-earth. And group number four will be recycling. I'll put that in the chat in a second. And what I would like for everyone to talk about is um, specific to your group's topic, either things that you plan to do, changes that you plan to make that you haven't done already, or things that you've already been doing that, um, that I haven't talked about. I'm here to learn too, selfishly. I wanna learn from all of you guys. And what we'll do is after we talk, um, we'll say 15, 20 minutes, we'll come back together. And I'm just gonna ask that everybody in each group kind of has a spokesperson for each group. And then that person will talk for a few minutes about what the group discussed. Um, all right, so let me put those groups. Oh, they're already in here. Okay, perfect. Joe, if you don't mind, let's divide everybody up into groups. Sure. And then we'll continue the conversation in smaller groups. Okay. Yeah, it looks like. Oh, yeah, I'm... there's there's four, three or four people in each group. I'll join. There's one with two, so I'll join that one. Okay, Perfect. here we go. I'm gonna open up all the rooms. You folks can click in. So 15 minutes, okay? Sounds good. Okay. If I can figure out how to do this. Hi. Hey, Janet. Hey, Joe. Hi, Hannah. Hello. How are you? Hannah, are you off screen? I'm working on it. Give me one second. Oh, OK. Sure. OK, sure. no worries. So Joe, what group are we in? Recycle? Oh, uh, we're group four. So yes, we're recycle. <laughs> Thank you for asking. Um, so I'm just curious, do you know if there has been any, um, any development, new developments in terms of plastic recycling? Because like we were talking, like Kay just mentioned the little things that you throw out and 
most of the time I think, well, they're not recyclable, are they? Right. Yeah, no, I don't think so. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, I'm just, I wanna set a timer before I forget. Okay. Because I'm the timekeeper. Okay. Um, yeah, no, I don't think so. I mean, I think things have not gotten any better in terms of, you know, actually recycling plastics. Yeah. Um, there's just no market for them. And even, um, what else? I think even glass, like, and paper, um, there's not much of a market for it, which is incredible. You know, yeah. I mean, how many years has this been going on that we've been recycling this stuff? And if, you know, there isn't a market for it now, then something's wrong. Right, right. Well, it's just cheaper to make this stuff and throw it away. Yeah. And I think that's one of the biggest problems we face is it's right. expensive to recycle. So right. To do that. Right. But, you know, as is often the case, I suspect, I don't know, but I suspect that the raw materials that are being harvested, whether it's, you know, silica to make glass or wood pulp to make paper, it's being subsidized. You know, it cannot, I, I just can't believe that it's cheaper to cut down trees in Canada and, you know, ship them to the United States or to some pulping plant, pulp them up, make paper and ship that paper to New York when we've got a ton of paper here to be recycled. Right. You know, I mean, right. that just can't be right. Yeah. Anyway, who so knows? What, so can you just tell me again what we're supposed to be doing within oh, the group? Me? You want me? Yes. <laughs> um, or maybe I Hannah, can... do you know what we're supposed to be doing? <laughs> Honestly, I kind of like blanked out by the fourth time that she was like, do this. So I couldn't yeah. tell you. <laughs> I, I mean, I think the idea is <clears throat> recycling is our topic. So I think just to discuss recycling and our experiences with it, what we know, what we don't know, and just kind of, you know, share something when we come back Okay. with the main group. So, um, so yeah. Hannah, where are you from? And how can you recycle? Do you have that opportunity? Yes, um, I live in Pennsylvania. One tidbit that I can say is that if you buy lettuce that's packaged, um, like romaine or any type of lettuce, Organic Girl does it in 100% uh, recycled plastic. So, I mean, you can buy lettuce that's local and avoid the plastic, but if you don't have that option. Organic Girl does do that, and it oh. is organic. That's cool. That's good to know. Now, is that, do you think that's nationwide? Like, could we find that here? I would definitely say so because they're from California and I'm mm -hmm. all the way on the East Coast by you guys. So, yeah. Definitely. Right. Okay. That's good. Yeah. Um, so, I'll share one thing that I've been thinking about lately, and that is that um, our town has hired a, a waste hauler. We don't have like, you know, um, town employees don't pick up our waste. That that was the case when I was a kid in another town. Um, but um, here, everybody had like a private hauler. And now our town has hired one company to, to haul everybody's trash and pick it up at our curbside. But word on the street is, is that they don't actually recycle when they pick up the recycling, which in, in New York State is the law. Like you have to recycle. You cannot just throw everything into the the trash, but the recycling company or the hauling company, they're not actually recycling. And they're, they're saying that there's just no market for the plastic, the paper, the glass or anything. So they're basically landfilling everything apparently and um, burning some of it. Um, so I don't even know if they're even running their recycling plant anymore, which is kind of crazy Yeah, and frustrating. Yeah. You know, so do you think that the the waste from your town goes to a landfill, or do you think it goes to an incinerator, or are there any local landfills anymore? You know what? I think the last I heard, um, our our waste was actually being landfilled in Pennsylvania. Did Sorry, that? Hannah. <laughs> That's what I heard too. Um, my brother lives in Connecticut, and he told me that they incinerate all their waste. So there it goes up in the air. That's yeah. terrible. 
Which is I really, mean, especially plastic, that's really bad to burn. I mean, I know they say they have scrubbers and whatever else to filter out the stuff, but you can filter out everything. So, you, so I live in Kent and we, they do have garbage pickup. It's not municipal, it's private. Um, so we just take everything to the recycling center in Kent. And that really has been a godsend because they take recyclables and, um, you know, they take your garbage and it's a member, you pay a fee, you know, a yearly fee, and then you pay per garbage bag. So that's how, how it works over there. Oh. Um, so that, that's like an incentive to not create waste. Absolutely. Because you pay per bag. Yeah, exactly. Oh, that's great. That's right. good. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not expensive. I think the yearly fee might be $60 a family. So that's not much at all. And then per bag, maybe it's $4 for a, a you know, full-size garbage bag. Um, but the bad thing that happened I, like six months ago or so was that they, you know, we were bringing our plastic and I was putting in every little thing of plastic, you know, that I could find the, the logo on. And they at one point said, we're not recycling, nobody's recycling any of that. So what's the point? You know, but then a couple of months later, they moderated that and said, oh, yes, still keep put, putting your plastic that has a logo on it in the recycling bin. Mm. So, um, so anyway. Yeah. That, um, I don't know if you saw it in the chat, but I, I mentioned that uh, uh, documentary that PBS produced last year called Plastic Wars. And um, that, in that movie, they basically said like almost none of this stuff is getting recycled because they, they went to like a plastic warehouse where all the supposedly recycled, recyclable plastic was, you know, being sent. And they had it um, kind of smushed into, uh, you know, big gigantic packages basically like is you know five or six feet tall by five or six feet wide and and they said that you know they were pulling bits out and they're like okay this isn't really recyclable this shouldn't be here and this should be here and they basically said like this is going to just actually get landfilled because there's so much non-recyclable stuff in here and i know when i take walks in my neighborhood i see people put like styrofoam in the recycling container and i know that that's not recyclable so we're all contaminating, you know, the, the, the little bits of plastic that are actually recyclable, we're contaminating it, and then they're just landfilling it because it's contaminated, you know, right. so that's like another problem with this whole system. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. I mean, supposedly we have uh, like a credit card's worth of plastic in our bodies. <sighs> You know, just from inject, you know, whatever. We don't even realize what we're ingesting. Yeah. So, I don't know if that that means it's fiber. You know, is it uh, like the you know fiber made from uh, fossil fuels? Like they start, they opened up these plants um, with the Trump administration in Pennsylvania. Hannah, maybe you know about this, where they were using um, fossil fuels to make clothes. It was a big you know, because fracking is starting, the mount is starting to come down and of course oil and every, everybody's kind of anti-fossil fuels. Um, they were establishing these huge plants to make clothing. And so this is another one of my pet peeves because mm -hmm. you walk into clothing stores and you look at the labels and everything is, is, made, is nylon. You know, it's some form of nylon now. Yeah, so I didn't me. hear. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, I didn't actually hear about that story. Maybe if you like have a news article you could send or something, maybe I, I can just look it up afterwards, but I didn't hear about that with the clothing. Um, yeah. I know that we just stopped, this was like this week, two days ago, I think it was. Mm -hmm. um, Pennsylvania, the Delaware River Basin is, we've made it where you cannot frack. And I mean, they're going to um, repeal the ban, but it, it is a good thing that we did that, you know? I did oh. hear that. Yeah. I did not. That's and that great. Was, I think that's Delaware, Pennsylvania, New York, and New Jersey are all part of that because there's so many, you know, so many downstream effects too. Same river, same river basin. Yeah. 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 So 
That's interesting. Hannah, send me or or what's your email? I'll send I'll send you an article. I'll put my email in the chat. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And also, if you don't mind telling me, uh, because you're from Pennsylvania, did you hear about this uh, event on Eventbrite? I did. Yeah, I was I was specifically looking for sustainable events, and this was one that popped up. So I cool. definitely want to check out. I knew what zero waste was, and that's what I was trying to do. But I wanted to connect with a different community. You know? Oh, nice. Well, I'm glad you found us. I, um, I'm going to add somebody to our group. I think they just joined the meeting and so they're like out by themselves. So I'm going to bring them in here. Okay. And I'm curious because we were talking about manufacturing and the pollution, like the air pollution from the fracking facilities. Have you guys heard of the chemical PFOS or forever chemicals? Oh yeah. So there's two documentaries that I would definitely recommend. One is called The Devil We Know, and that it's about drinking water that's polluted by these uh, facilities in the manufacturing. And the second one, which is I think the most recent, uh, it's called Dark Waters. Mark Ruffalo started that. Yeah, oh. they're definitely really great resources. I haven't seen that yet, but it's on my list. And that's like a um, historical, you know, uh, nonfiction. I mean, it's a recreation of a real story, right? Yep, it all happened in West Virginia where a uh, DuPont plant was and they polluted the air, water, and the whole community got sick from it. and. I don't know if today it's the largest uh, medical monitoring, but that's what it was. They medical monitored all the people and that's how they came up with the evidence to say that these people got sick from the plant and the chemical that it was emitting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Aren't the PFOSs, those are really challenging on uh, military bases, right? I think they use them in um, fire suppression. So even Stewart by us, Joe, you know, this, the base Stewart there, Airport. they've got, they have contamination from, from PFOS up there. Oh. Yeah. My son is a, a geologist and he works for an environmental remediation company. And uh, I mean, he's making his living off of the, the mistakes that we're, we make. Uh, like this, you know, like ground, water, and air contamination. It's just, it's so sad. Um, and it's all preventable, you know. I mean, so much of this is preventable, easily preventable. Uh, yeah. So, um, in a few minutes, we're going to go back to the main group, and um, we need a, a spokesperson, and I'd rather it not be me. Uh, if either of you could kind of just like, you know, just, uh, a minute or so um, just to share a couple of the things that we've we've chatted about. I don't exactly volunteer to be the spokesperson, but I will add one last thing. Um, since we're talking about water and plastic and uh, recycled content, I'll call it, um, we don't actually drink the water that comes from our tap. We um, live across from apple or what used to be an apple orchard and is now uh, some type of farming field. We think it's corn. And so what we do is we take our gallon jugs or yeah, gallon jugs, and we take it to the grocery store and we refill it from their water dispense. That is reverse osmosis, which removes the chemicals and different contaminants. And then we put it through a carbon block filter at home. And that's what we drink. So to tie in the plastic, we use um, plastic bottles, unfortunately, but we do reuse them. We don't throw them away or recycle them. We keep using them until we can't anymore, as long as we can. Right. Yeah, you have to use, you have to use new ones eventually, right? Because they eventually they wind up, um, I think, leaching into your water. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's why we like to put it through the carbon block filter. And then in case there was any, like if it sat in the jugs and it was in hot weather or in the sun and the plastic leached into the water, we can remove that with the Berkey. It's wow. Like a, a Berkey filter. That's, that's really 
a lot to have to go through for water. Is that is that one of the reasons why you're so interested in these issues, Hannah? Um, well, I would say yes, but it's not from our my family's personal experience, so to speak. I uh, went at a younger age to a school that was environmentally friendly, and that introduced me to the idea of uh, environmental activism and what it means to care for the earth and care for each other because in order to care for your community, you have to care for what the community is in and the kind of environment. So I'd say that a whole bunch of things kind of brought me around to the idea that we need to be responsible. All right, cool. All right, so our time is up. So I'm gonna close the rooms now. We'll, we'll meet back with a big group. Okay. Janet, would you mind? Uh... I don't even know what to say, Joe. Our conversation really was kind right, of- I just, just, yeah. just say something, you say something. All right. <laughs> You're better. Okay. okay. All right, I'll see you guys back in the okay. big room. Hello, welcome back. Thank Hello. you. Michael, that's a background, right? That's not like your background. This is the um, Fox Mulder's office from the- <gasps> <laughs> it's my dream, my dream room. That's very on brand. For you. <laughs> I know. And look, I had this was not intentional. I have my my alien mug also. <laughs> <laughs> Did you see the pictures of Mars yet? The loser. What? No, yes. I mean, of course. They're beautiful. Yeah. That's my home planet. Yes. <laughs> I was talking to Libby about if we were to live on Mars, we would be Martians, and but our dog would still be a dog. Like she's not an alien; she would just be a dog on Mars. <laughs> and that just like, blew her mind. That'd be an, a good children's book. That would be very cute. You could write it. Okay. And I'll buy it. Ryan <laughs> illustrate it. Oh yeah, that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna write it down. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> did we have a group missing or did we lose I think we've people? lost I think we've lost some people yeah, yeah I think as I, soon as you you mentioned breakout rooms some people are like I'm out of here yeah, yeah. Really <laughs> people, so I don't blame them <laughs> I had did. no idea that you could even do this on zoom it's a very cool feature that I did not know about until Joe introduced me to it because I think teachers know like all of the the Zoom tricks. Yeah, I had no idea. Yeah, it's very handy. We we do actually have a new uh, a new participant, Giannis. I don't know if I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Yes. Welcome. Welcome. <laughs> um, I apologize for keeping you waiting. We were in breakout rooms when you joined, I think. So so, so how many people? Uh, were there before the breakout rooms? Uh, 19. 19. So you see, if you have 19 people, I think the idea of breakout rooms, that's what I've seen in other, in other places too. Like people choose to stay in the main room. Like when they give them an option. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. If it's yeah. a small group, it's, it's good to keep it, uh, to keep it like one, unless you have different themes and then actually it makes sense or different activities and then it makes yeah. sense to actually break yeah. it. So um, we were we're gonna um, just kind of share a little bit about uh, what we discussed in our in our group. So Yanis, we had a reduce group, reuse, re-earth, as in composting and recycle. So um, I guess Wonderful. we should go in order. Yeah, before before we get there, I just want to go through the chat because there's a lot of really good stuff in here, and I was I was. Okay. Googling as you guys were working. Um, so Hannah had asked about, or no, who was it? Yeah, Hannah asked about organic tofu um, in a sustainable material. I don't, it's not organic, but this is, oh, I guess it's flipped. Morinaga, they sell this at Acme. Um, I think Greens also carries it and it's not every single store, but if you go on morinaga.com, you can like, there's like a store finder. Um, you could also make tofu at home, but I, I would never, I would never force anyone to go through that arduous and horribly messy uh, 
process. So it's uh, Mori New or Mori Naga dash USA dot com. Um, it's not organic. That's the only thing. It is non GMO, but it's not organic. But at least it comes. Oh, hello. So before we go and talk about everything that everyone talked about in the group, I'm just going through the chat and catching up on everything that was in there. Um, so there was a question about organic tofu in sustainable packaging. This is a Tetra pack, this kind of like carton material, and it's made out of multiple materials. So it's basically like a plastic coated cardboard, but it is technically recyclable, not necessarily always recycled. Um, and somebody else had mentioned TerraCycle which is an organization that will send you, you have to buy them, but they send you this big old box that you fill it up, you send it back. There's different boxes for different things. So there's like an office waste, there's um, toothpaste tube recycling boxes. There's all sorts of different stuff. Check it out. It's a very cool site. And they also have, um, they partner with different with different manufacturers like Colgate has a box and some of these boxes are actually free. There are wait lists for a lot of them. Um, but if you sign up, that's one of the best ways that you can recycle things and know that they are going to be recycled as best as possible is with TerraCycle. Um, I lost my spot. Let's see, a lot of people mentioning story of stuff. That's what I was talking about before when I completely blanked on where I learned about this stuff. Um, somebody asked me privately if there's a way to research what businesses have implemented environmentally sustainable business practices to help decide where to shop. Excellent question. The answer to that is yes. Um, there are a couple of things that you could look for when you are searching on the internets for things to buy. Um, for me, honestly, the one thing that I look for is a B Corp certification. There's this little blue seal that usually ends up either in like the about us section or if there's an FAQ page or if there's a mission statement or sometimes right at the bottom of the website. And what that means is in their incorporating documents, they have something that says that we are going to, to act in an environmentally sustainable way. A lot of times they also incorporate like ethical um, and equitable business practices as well. There's also um, the Carbon Fund or carbonfund.org. They have a little seal for people who have partnered with the Carbon Fund and what they are doing is trying to reduce their carbon emissions. There is also 1% for the planet. That's another little seal that you'll see. Um, actually, if you go on, if you have like an open window on the computer, if you go to earthhero.com, that's one of my favorite websites. They have very, very high standards for the things that they will sell through that website. They themselves are B Corp certified. They're partnered with the Carbon Fund. They are the 1% for the planet. They have that little certification and they only sell things from companies that have met their standards. Um, another one that is new to me that was mentioned in the chat was buyifyoucare.com and just perusing the website, it looks like all of their stuff is sold without plastic packaging. It's like brown paper packaging. Um, and that's another way too. If a company has gone through the trouble of packaging their stuff using sustainable, recyclable packaging. That's usually a, a good bet. Um, what else did we see? Somebody had mentioned nylon. Hannah mentioned nylon. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, nylon, nylon is plastic and it's like everywhere. And a lot of times you'll see things like um, for like hair brushes, a big thing is boar bristle but then they'll market vegan boar bristle, but it's nylon. Same with like vegan plastic or vegan leather, it's plastic. Um, so one of the most startling statistics that I think I've ever read is that we ingest in microplastics about five grams of plastic a week. And guess what weighs five grams and is made out of plastic? a credit card. We eat a credit card's worth of plastic every week in the form of microplastics, usually in our water and also like Hannah mentioned, uh, bristles in our, our toothbrush. So um, it looks like Brush with Bamboo has compostable bristles. Bamboo is a fantastic material. Um, 
that is used in lieu of, of plastic. And have I hit everything? Okay. Um, uh, I have one question on the, on the like, let's say, bamboo replacement or like uh, replacing with plant-based materials, mm -hmm. like replacing plastics with these. Now, do you know of any study as to what, how intensive would be to replace plastics with, like if we wanted to cultivate, to do like uh, farms of bamboo trees? Mm -hmm. And how intensive could that be on the on the environment? Like, has anybody done the, the accounting? Because that would be a question that would be cool to think about, like to see, if, to do the cost benefit analysis, see if it's really worth it. Right. Wow. I don't know of a single study. I don't know if anybody's ever tackled that. It's such a huge thing. But like you said, it's a really interesting thought experiment. Yeah. That I would love that I would love to have with you. Um, let's email about that. I think that there's a lot of different things to consider. And one of the biggest issues with plastic that you don't find with things like bamboo is that it is it doesn't decompose and it just sticks around for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. So how do you quantify that? And how do you include that in, in that cost benefit analysis? Because for some people, they don't care. For me, I care a lot. And so I think part of the issue is that we need to figure out a way of, of um, studying this stuff in a way that makes sense. But that's a big thing though. So I wanna table that for a second because we do, I do wanna get through what you guys talked about in the breakout rooms and Giannis, we will continue talking about that um, some other time. And then we'll, we'll all meet back together and talk about it or something, I don't know. Group number one, the reduced group. Was there a spokesperson that is still here? <laughs> Was there nobody in that group that's still here? I'm here. Julia, hello. What did you guys talk about? Um, Peggy, uh, Micah, and Michael uh, were in the group with me, I think. And Micah had some great ideas. Uh, she directed us to um, blueland.com for household items and Lush for personal um, hygiene items. Um, and we talked about um, reducing, safe. yeah, clothes. Peggy, take it from here. There you uh, are. Well, I, just, I just remembered, uh, apparently there's a book called Fixation by a woman named Sandra Gold, gold something, gold wa I have, but I- Gold, gold mark, gold mark. Gold mark. Yes, you, you go gold, ahead, Michael, you talk about it because you brought it up. Sandra Goldmark, she's on the theater faculty at Barnard in New York City, and she's done some pop-ups. Before the pandemic, she had a pop-up a pop uh, shops that she and colleagues would do fixing things that were broken for free. And, but she, in her book, she talks about and the reason why we got on this is Micah is in the theater program at Yale and she's in the costume design arena and um, Sandra Goldmark is in the theater department at Barnard and has looked at doing sustainable set design and reusing and repurposing things. So that's how that came up, but go ahead, Peggy, take it away. Uh, well, actually you did it. Um, then, then the other thing that we heard about again from Micah uh, something called Blue Land. I just put that name in the chat. Ooh, I think I sent it to Micah by mistake. Um, it should go to everybody, but Blue Land. And they have household products. And Micah, do you want to talk about that, the little tablets? Yeah, of course. Um, so there's this company, Blue Land. It was originally a, like a Shark Tank uh, proposal. And then it really blew up over social media where um, this mom wanted to reduce her chemicals and her waste uh, for her kids and her household. And so she and I, I believe she has a partner, they came up with this program where you can buy a starter pack, which gives you a couple glass containers and some tablets for things like um, laundry detergent, hand soap, uh, cleaning glass and general cleaning. And 
you are just paying for the bottle the one time and then you just pay for the tablets as needed. And this way you're reducing plastic consumption as well as you're not paying to be shipping the water that's in these cleaning products across the world. And so then you just pop that tablet into the glass bottle with water uh, and it foams up for a few minutes and then you've got perfectly functional uh, cleaning products that are non-toxic. They have beautiful bottles. Yeah. You know, it's so nice to, to, when things are sustainable, but they're also like aesthetically pleasing, they definitely hit the mark on that. Mm -hmm. It's funny, they, it just popped up on a YouTube ad, like right before I got on this. It's like in the airwaves, we're all thinking about it right now. Uh, Micah also mentioned that you can make, because I was asking about trying to stop using plastic wrap. I use wax paper. Please don't tell me that that's bad too. I'll just <laughs> die. Um, aluminum foil, which I try not to use very much of. But um, Micah said that you could make your own beeswax wraps with 100% cotton and beeswax. I'm sure there's a recipe somewhere on mm -hmm. Facebook and or um, on YouTube and you know, I'm, I, I keep thinking these are wonderful little businesses that people could start up in their kitchen and sell at the farmer's market, you know, or, and then I was, I was also lamenting that there's no place around here where I can take a clean jar that I know is clean and fill it up with, I don't know what, oatmeal or something, steel cut oats or flour or whatever, and then take it home, but I'm forced into buying packaging. I mean, even with Blue Land, as lovely as that sounds, I have old shampoo bottles that I would love to reuse until they, you know, fall apart, which they never will. So, you know, we just have to be more creative and more communicative about these things and, and, and educate people. I went to school in France. I'll just say this really quickly. And um, when I went over there, I was just amazed at how few clothes people had. Now, this was a while ago, but um, you know, it was just a different way of living and they had less packaging as well. And my last story, I remember hearing about, maybe this is apocryphal, but I don't know, a, a little um, boy somewhere in, I don't know, Botswana, looking at all of the barges bringing in clothes from America and thinking, oh, that's all from dead people, because it never occurred to him that somebody who was living would be giving away their clothing, you know, a country where you wear things until it falls off your body. Yeah. So it's the way we live. Patty, I think that you had mentioned the bulk in the chat, and I was going to say this before. There is a place in Newtown, Connecticut. It is an entirely package-free shop. It's called BD Provisions, B as in boy, D as in Denmark. And you bring your own packaging, or you can just fill up like paper bags full of stuff. I haven't been there in a year, though, so I don't know how they're handling the pandemic. I know that Whole Foods also has a bulk section, but right now everything is pre-packaged and Greens or Mrs. Greens and there's one in Yorktown, there's one in Mount Kisco, now there's one um, right on Route 6, like in Summers. Okay. They also have a bulk section, so you could bring, and I, I was at Greens not long ago and asked if I could bring in my own containers and they said yes. So I think that everybody's handling things um, differently. I, I, I want to say that it's like a, a municipality thing, whether or not or you're allowed to use um, your own containers at these places. But yeah, wonderful. Thank you. Um, group number two. So the reuse group. That was me and Cindy. And I took I took notes. Can you share? So I, I can share. Um, we, we talked about the fact that when, when I was young, um, we used to send clothing back and forth to Florida. I had an older cousin and then a younger cousin and my sister. And when we got a box of clothing from Florida, it was very exciting, new things that would fit me. Um, years ago, that's what people did. We used to share clothing and toys with relatives. Um, so, so that's one thing that people could consider doing if they have children of the same sex a few years apart. Um, Mike Smith was talking about reusing jars, you know, glass jars to, to do different things. And we were both talking about um, 
you know, we, we have plastic like Tupperware that does last a long time, but it's old and we can continue to, to use it. We talked about your, your buy nothing site and how wonderful that is. And, and we've both um, contributed and gotten things from that. That's like the best thing. Um, uh, Mike mentioned Craigslist um, and I mentioned mm. that at town hall, they actually have some parking spots in case there's gonna be an exchange of money or anything. Um, if, if you're selling something to somebody, um, it needs to be safe. So there's cameras at town hall and designated parking spots for exchanges. Um, Mike mentioned, and I've also put things out at the end of my driveway um, with a sign free and people do take chairs and things as long as they're in good condition. We both mentioned Goodwill and how lucky we are to have one so close in Baldwin Place. Um, and we're not sure if everything that's donated there stays in that store or if some of the items are shipped to other places or not. Um, I mentioned Junk Luggers, which is in, I believe, Connecticut, in Stamford, and also in, in Yorktown. Um, when I had to clean out my attic some years ago, um, we called Junk Luggers. Um, it's not the same as 1-800-GOT-JUNK or because junk luggers at their warehouse will separate anything that's donatable from junk that no one can use. And they have partnerships with some organizations and then they will send you um, donation receipts for anything that they remove. You have to pay them but any, you know, to come to your house and it's based on how much they caught away. Mm -hmm. and it's a half a truck, well. a quarter of a truck, you know, things like that. But they do make reusable things, um, you know, to be donated and then they will email you the receipts. So, so that's good. And when, before junk loggers, um, were able to take and donate some furniture that I had that was still in good condition. I tried finding places that would take um, some furniture. Um, and I found a place called Furniture Share House. Um, but unfortunately, they don't come to Putnam. That, that's for people oh. in Westchester. Um, but they will actually pick up furniture that's in good condition and donate it to people who were setting up homes, you know, people possibly who had been in shelters or who had other issues. And the fact that they will come and pick up the furniture is great if you happen to live in Westchester. Wonderful. So, so that's basically what we, Mike and I came up with. Basically, that's like, that's a ton of stuff. Wonderful, thank you. <laughs> Okay. That's great. Okay. Um, we're up to re-earth and we're starting to run low on time. So I want to get to everybody. We might run a little bit late, but let's, who is in the re-earth group? So that was me and uh, I, don't, I don't know his name. You there? Well, Mary, if, you could, if you could share, that'd be great. Well, we didn't really have that much to say because one woman, she was from Canada and she lived in a condo and she really didn't um, do any um, composting. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know where the other guy is. He's, he lives in Mayapak and he said he just took his food and put it in his garden without really mm -hmm. composting it uh, in the back of his yard. So, I mean, I, to me, that would attract animals, but he said he didn't have any issue with that. And um, I have a, I just went out and bought a new composting bin, a nice one that actually turns and everything. And so, but it's only been since COVID that I've been doing it and it hasn't really turned yet. So I haven't really, you know, gotten my first compost because it's sitting out there frozen. But um, we'll see what happens in the spring. So yeah, 
Yeah. <laughs> so we, we had limit, and then we talked about how some towns and Yorktown's trying to do that um, have uh, actually started programs for people that don't compost in their yards or in their in apartments, and they can bring it to a central site, and then um, the county and the there's a grant or something, and they transport it up to a big composting site. The only thing is they have to put it in trucks to bring it up, I don't know, two hours up north to get to the site. Um, but those programs are around some of the, um, you know, some towns in Westchester. And of course, the issue is to get the household people involved in, in those participate. But some of them, like Artsning and I think Scarsdale was one of the original ones. They're doing they're doing very well. With those mm. Yeah, there's curbside composting as well, and then community gardens. I don't. I just we just don't have that here yet. Yeah, yet. Yeah. Yet is the operative word. Curbside is actually a company out there that will come, um, but you have to pay. You know, right? You have to pay extra for that. And I mm -hmm. looked into it, and it was sort of a lot of money. So, yeah, yeah, it, you know, it's all good, but I didn't want to pay, you know, a lot of people don't want to pay on top of whatever else services they have. You know? Right. Yeah. I, I think Tilly Foster has a community garden. They do. Across the street, they have that little garden there. I don't know if right. they're composting, though. And then also, I know New Paltz has a community garden, but okay. I think they do. I think Tilly Foster does because they have the animals, so I think that they do. Right. There's talk of putting in a new community garden near our Desmond Fish Library in the Garrison area too. Um, I, I think it's early planning on that, but a friend and I are already looking to try to get a plot there. So I don't know what they will do, but they're doing really wise things at the Desmond Fish Library in terms of using the land around it. They're going to put in solar panels, have so many environmentally sensitive um, installations there so it might be a good thing for anybody living closer to garrison to check out as well very nice excellent okay oh, yeah. so this yes. one's a crazy thing I, it just occurred to me i hope nobody takes it the wrong way but um somebody had something like end of life about shampoo bottles and it got me thinking about you know i i made a will a while ago and um i think about my own end of life and i don't want to use new wood for a casket, you know, and have myself formaldehyde. I know that there are environmentally friendly ways to say goodbye to planet Earth or become part of one <laughs> with planet Earth. So I know nothing about that, but, you know, something to look into. There are natural burials. There <laughs> are, you know, cremation services and, and, and what have you. So there are, there are options for sure. Um, we are at... Is, is a little bit again back to the discussion of doing the cost benefit cremation is very energy heavy so i don't think that's actually that's something another thing to, to for a future discussion okay <laughs> great point yeah um so i think there um, are green burials they're doing a lot of green burials in the pacific northwest and they have these oh, things yeah. called mushroom suits that you, the body gets wrapped in and there's mycelium or some, some kind of something in there that helps um, rapidly break down your organic material. So that in terms of its um, cost to the planet, it's much, much less than, you know, sticking a person in a box in, in the cemetery or, or cremation. Very cool. I the love mushrooms. Hey, hey, and Kay, Kay, it sounds like that's another webinar. Yeah, host. <laughs> It'll draw, the, especially the sixty-five and upset. Yeah. Be very interested. Uh, um, we're getting close to our. We are at the end of our time, so I want to hear from the recycling group very quickly, and then, and then we'll wrap up. Who okay. was it? Um, yeah, I was in that group, and okay. um, my two partners refused to speak, so uh, I'm stuck. Um, so. I mean, frankly, a lot of what we had to say was about how difficult it is to recycle and uh, the fact that um, in Putnam County, a lot of the local haulers are not actually recycling. They're picking up our recycling, but it's actually being landfilled and they're admitting this openly now. Um, one thing I thought of that we didn't discuss in my group is that 
um, Putnam County is actually revising their solid waste uh, management plan this year. And that's something that they intend to address because there are laws in place that actually forbid them from haulers from doing that, from landfilling recyclables. So, um, but the, you know, honestly, they're in a difficult position because there's no market for recyclables, which was a, another issue we addressed. And I'll just, if I could throw in one more anecdote, Kay, um, while we were talking, it reminded me that um, just uh, about a year ago, while I was still teaching, um, some of my students were doing a project on immigration and rag picking was a, an occupation that was in every city in, in the US, there were rag pickers. It doesn't sound like a very noble profession, but they basically um, brought horse-drawn car carts through neighborhoods and to you know, uh, factories and textile um, uh, places and, and picked up scraps of, of fabric. Um, but they also recycled other things. They picked those things up and they were pulped and made into you know, re like really excellent paper has cotton fiber in it. Um, and so they made a living doing this. Um, people's old rags, you know, were, were recycled into, into paper. Um, and uh, my, actually my great grandfather who came over from Ireland uh, and, and, you know, lived, settled in the Bronx, that's what he did. He was a rag picker. And I never actually even knew what that meant uh, until last year. But, so there you go. I've never heard of this before. How yeah. interesting. Yeah, I mean, really, when it comes to living sustainably, we should be looking to the past and to other countries that don't have as much as we do. We are so focused on convenience that we've forgotten about the sustainability. And if you look at anybody else who just has less and see what they do to make things last, that's where the answer is, really. They use um, banana leaves to serve fast food. Oh, in, yeah. You know, India, Indonesia. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a great idea. Yeah. And I mean, now it's becoming very chic. And like, you know, because we, it's like we're saying no to plastic and we're going with palm leaves or, you know, coconut for our, our beachside smoothies or cocktails or whatever. Um, the, sorry, the, the hipsters, they're, you know, wrapping meat now instead of plastic, they're doing newspaper like they used to do in the, in the 40s and the 50s. Yeah, so. or like serving things on like wood slab. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right, guys, we are out of time. Thank you all so much for joining us today. I'm going to put my email one last time into the chat so that we can continue these conversations. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Be sure to sign up for future workshops. Joe, any last words? Just uh, thank you to UK and um, we will follow up with an email to the email you use to register for this event um, with you know the chat, the recording link um, and, uh, and anything else Kay would like to send. I'll be speaking with her later. All right, thanks everybody. Great to thank see you, you and great to meet so many new people. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Have a wonderful day, everyone. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.